Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all so much for being here today. I'm Jenny Levine, Humanities and Adult Programming Coordinator for Durham County Library. And this program is sponsored by Durham Library Foundation. And it was magically conceived of and coordinated by Carter Q, who will introduce our guest in just a moment. Restrooms, if you need them, are just out this doorway and to the right, uh, water fountains as well. We're having, uh, we have a photographer here in the house today, and if you do not want to be photographed, let us know, and we'll put a sticker on you, and we will not take your picture. Uh, evaluation forms. If you enjoyed today's program and could give us some feedback and turn, uh, fill out an evaluation form on your way out, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Carter Q, take it away. I'd like to um, thank everyone for taking time from your very busy schedule on this very uh, rainy cold day yes, evening to come out yes. but i guarantee you for those of you who probably were uh doing your thing or as james brown would say shaking your money maker at the at woodstock or who happened to be in new york on the jazz loft scene when uh, juma was in house uh if you can uh bring that back up again just for a short period of time i i guarantee you that you will warm up a bit I uh, just want to say a little bit about our uh, featured uh, speaker, uh, Juma Sultan, um, who's a native of California, Monrovia, California, as a matter of fact, is a musician who has been involved in music for over 50 years, uh, having endeavored to increase the understanding of music in the context of African and Afro-American cultures. He is best known for his appearance at Woodstock in 1969, playing with Jimi Hendrix. He currently plays in the African performance group Sankofa, the band Sons of Thunder, and with the Juma Sultan Band. Juma performed in 1969 at Woodstock and Hendrix's band Gypsy Sun and Rainbows and on the Dick Cavett Show and at a special show in Harlem, New York several weeks later. He was interviewed extensively for the documentary films Jimi Hendrix and Jimi Hendrix Live at Woodstock. You can also find him on approximately 12 of Jimi Hendrix's posthumous releases. Juma Sultan's musical talent spanned jazz, rock, blues, and spirituals through decades of performing, producing, and recording. In 2006, Clarkson University, in conjunction with Juma, received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to preserve Juma's audio and video documentation of avant-garde jazz during the 1960s and 70s. The collection may be viewed at www.jumasarchive.org. Juma also appeared at the National Rock Concert, National Rock Con, from July 30th, 2010 through August 1st, 2010. Juma has also joined with Vince Martell, Spanky and Our Gang, and Blue Ocean at B.B. King's on August 2nd, 2010 for the encore of California Dreaming. Juma also recorded with Archie Shepp, Noah Howard, Calaprusha Maurice McIntyre, Sonny Simmons, Aisha Nan, Emeretta Marks, the Don Moore Band, and the person that we have here in, in house, Daoud Haroon, and Sankofa. Juma has also written about, has been written about in numerous books and publications, uh, such as most recent release in 2016, Loft Jazz, Improvised in New York in the 1970s, and Real History, The Lost Archive of Juma Sultan and the Aboriginal Music Society. Without further ado, Mr. Juma Sultan. Oh. Thank you very much. I'm going to speak in that one. Good evening, everyone. All right. Uh, I want to thank you for coming out. I know it's uh, sort of a, not so bright of a day, but we're going to see if we can make it brighter. Uh, I'm going to uh, uh, start off the presentation with a, uh, uh, a sizzle reel, uh, I call it. It's a, uh, uh, just a three-minute clip of a uh, of a reflection of the music of that time. Uh, so uh, I would like to start out with that and then uh, I'll, I'll, pr I'll proceed. So thank you.
But when I got to, to this city, there was no money to be made. There wasn't no clubs to hire known musicians. So that's how I got hooked up with, with, with Studio Week. Without New York's loft jazz of the 60s, 70s, and 80s, American music wouldn't be the same. Jazz, rock, R&B, even modern classical music has been fired up and inspired by this vibrant scene. Cost of Freedom is a documentary about avant-garde musicians who collectively took control of their destiny, formed alliances, and organized independent concerts at artist-owned spaces. It's a story of revolutionary music that expressed the struggles of New York's music scene and how they galvanized the community. Cost of Freedom marks the trail of musical pioneers who put avant-garde soul into American music and were the first music rights activists. Juma Sultan, Pharaoh Saunders, Archie Shep, Sonny Simmons, Milford Graves, and more. When I got to, to this city, there wasn't no money to be made. Right. Mm-hmm. There wasn't no clubs to hire known musicians. So that's how I got hooked up with, with, stu- with Studio Week. Mm-hmm. Here's the deal. We've been awarded initial funds from Duke University, enough to restore a portion of our 1,500 hours of audio and video, but not enough to bring this project to completion. For that, we need your help to kickstart. Your contribution will help us bring together the story, the documentary, and an archive of audio, video, and artwork. When you make a Kickstarter contribution, we'll include your name in the online production credits, and we're offering some great thank you gifts as well. You should check those out below. Let's celebrate the music of Juma Sultan, Farrell Saunders, Archie Shep, Sonny Simmons, Milford Graves, Sam Rivers, James Dubois, and so many others through the Cost of Freedom documentary. Please take a look, pick the amount that's right for you, and pledge now. You can find out more about this project and the music at jumascarchive.org. That's just uh, a brief example that in no way reflect the many individuals that were involved. Um, um, it was brought to my attention today that uh, in, in many of uh, my exploits, I haven't mentioned uh, many principals uh, that were involved at that period, but um, anyone knows that, that uh, preserving and uh, maintaining and, and transferring an archive uh, is, a, is a monumental task. It usually takes uh, uh, a lot of resources. And uh, uh, what you've seen thus far was a, uh, it was just a, a short clip that I was going to use last year for uh, crowdfunding uh, to try to generate money to complete uh, the rest of an archival collection. But it does reflect uh, some of the energies that were, that was happening at that time. And uh, um, I just, uh, would like to uh, say that, that at that time, as musicians, we were uh, as young and uh, uh, exploring, but we were uh, exploring the musical, we were exploring our, our, our spiritual responsibilities as musicians, and uh, uh, I see, like even now, that it, uh, it's, it's clear that we live in a time of a great conflict. We were living in a time of great conflict then, and an upheaval, and uh, the same, then, as in now, we got uh, unnatural disasters, uh, human behavior, uh, you know, uh, unusual behaviors extend, expand beyond the uh, neighborhoods and to, uh, you know, throughout the planet. You know, uh, you take violence, you know, it's no longer an undercurrent, but it's uh, uh, has surfaced uh, 
and has taken his share of blood uh, of, uh, of man. Uh, and uh, the vibration of, of doom is gaining uh, the majority vote in my mind. And uh, uh, this is a time of change, and we all know that uh, we, uh, what is our role? What is our role as a, 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 a spiritual musician uh, during this time? So uh, uh, free jazz reflected the turbulent and uncertain time that we're living in uh, back in the 60s. And it was uh, uh, closely implicated or, or associated with uh, the social upheaval, the civil rights movement, uh, the black artist movement. Uh, as far as I was concerned, the hippie dream, which is uh, flower, love one another, human rights. Uh, I was involved with, with uh, all of these types of activities. So, uh, but when we look back, we were still looking at turbulent times, uh, the war, and uh, the musicians um, during that period uh, formed uh, collectives. And uh, uh, they, were, they were formed all over the country in many aspects. Uh, right now, the, uh, the focus of the study seems to be on the uh, New York City jazz loft scene. But uh, I experienced uh, similar scenes throughout the country. There were, there were things prior to that that, uh, that are not uh, brought to the forefront. Uh, there were things happening in uh, uh, Pittsburgh. There were things happening in, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, not necessarily like the lofts, because uh, during that period, they were going through a lot of uh, gentrification in uh, New York City, and uh, the lost spaces were, were readily available. You could get a space this size here for uh, minimal money. Maybe not have plumbing. You'd be lucky if you had a good decent toilet, <laughs> you know. But uh, it was space, and, and it was uh, it was good space for artists to use because uh, as an artist, uh, sometimes you know if you were a horn player, you could practice in your apartment with a. Uh, a sock or a towel in, in your instrument. Uh, if you're a piano player, you can play low or whatever. But there was always, uh, uh, if you say, well, let's two or three of us get together, there were very few places to play. And so uh, many of the people that had larger spaces was utilizing them for living and also for their uh, creativity. So um, I want to uh, just go back for a minute to uh, uh, our role as uh, artists, and in, in, uh, not only uh, music, but in, but in all the art form, and uh, you know, what is our role? Well, I know that uh, uh, coming through those times, there were many influences like John Coltrane. Yes, they were commercial. Uh, there were, uh, there were uh, uh, other, uh, other influences, but uh, I just w would like to read a quote from John Coltrane, and he says, I want to be a force which is truly for good. And uh, uh, despite all of our uh, pros and cons as young people in those days, um, I know that how I felt uh, and uh, of your uh, initial uh, motives, uh, the motives of your heart, uh, I've always wanted to do. Um, I have to admit, as anybody else, my life may not have always reflected <laughs> Uh, that area uh, because of, of being young and, and, and not having knowledge uh, that, that was required due to what I call the miseducation system. Many things that uh, uh, I, I went through, I, uh, I went through a tumultuous uh, young uh, youth between uh, you know, 9 and 21. I had many problems in the neighborhood uh, in and out of institutions. And uh, finally it woke up and uh, I, uh, when I came out of one of the last ones, after uh, spending 18 months, I was able to get my GED and go to, uh, go to school. And I thought that was uh, part of the answer. And that's when I entered like uh, Pasadena City College. And uh, I, was, I was studying then. But I found that, that it was, uh, it, it is, is uh, uh, diverse and wild as uh, uh, even the neighborhoods. Uh, uh, the activities, even among the college students. So, uh, but I uh, uh, studied art, started playing music uh, in California, and uh, I, uh, prior to that, I had played in instruments uh, throughout uh, 
school, elementary, junior high, different instruments and tried different things. But uh, uh, I don't know, when I was around 20, 20 years old, I, I uh, picked up the upright bass. And I, uh, this was after meeting someone, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Sonny Simmons uh, in California. And uh, when I first experienced him playing live in a small room about as, as big as, uh, you know, 11 by 12 with a band, uh, I was, I was uh, deeply moved and uh, I could never imagine that I would play with him. And uh, I, uh, after a few years of uh, woodshedding, I, 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 we got back together in San Francisco. And uh, in San Francisco, uh, we, he and a drummer and myself played for about a year. And he said, well, you'll never really uh, be an accomplished musician unless you go to New York. So we followed him to New York. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he had a group uh, called the Depp Probers, which brought us to the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, uh, uh, any type of space where I lived, but we were able to practice there during the daytime. And it was just a small, uh, I guess they used to call them kitchenettes. Everything was in the same room, you know, the, <laughs> the bathtub, the kitchen, <laughs> and, and the bed. Uh, but uh, uh, this was uh, just a few do doors down from Slugs on uh, Third Street. And uh, uh, we used to come in there and play, and uh, the drummer, I mean, believe it or not, uh, we stayed there, we had partitions, and the drummer and I were sitting, standing there with a set of drums, and uh, so many uh, great people. I mean, we've had, we had the opportunity to play with uh, Albert Eidler, uh, Farrell Saunders, uh, as I said, Sonny Simmons, Dewey Redman, just so many people uh, would come by that, that, that we knew uh, from the West Coast, uh, Monty Waters, or we could, we could, I could go on and on. And that takes me back to why all the names are not here. When they have a list of credits, Eventually, uh, I, I hope not to preclude almost anyone. You know, I have uh, 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 maybe uh, 20 to 25 interviews of uh, musicians who possibly are still living. And uh, it's just like uh, uh, the, uh, the brother Dawood who was here, I was telling him that I have to uh, really uh, sit down and talk to him at some point because we all have a, uh, uh, a different Reflection, we're all different. And uh, uh, through this period, I experienced it through uh, uh, my eyes and being, and they, anybody else experiences it through their experiences. And uh, what happens is that we become a culmination of all of it. So I'd like to uh, just uh, uh, advance to uh, uh, the period of, that I'm speaking on, which is uh, so-called uh, the, the loft jazz period. And uh, during that period, uh, there were just uh, people who had uh, a desire to, to remain uh, true to their art. They also uh, they, uh, had very little uh, resources and they uh, uh, actually uh, came together collectively to uh, try to address some of the dilemmas, dilemmas excuse me. Uh, so uh, during this period, uh, it was mainly uh, the, uh, the concentration of the black musicians. Uh, they had uh, three important things. And uh, one, which we all were doing, uh, were, and, and, and also there were political and there were non-political, there were intellectuals, and there were just people from uh, different walks of life, from, uh, uh, from uh, drug addicts to uh, uh, derelicts that really knew the music. I mean, and, uh, and the problem is, is that I just realized, like, after uh, uh, 50 years, how judgmental I was. Mm. <laughs> because my predilections at that time, I mean, it took me this long to realize uh, that, that not considering myself a real judgmental person, that I was always judging other genres of music and, and, and individuals because people were always like, I remember when, uh, when Miles uh, uh, ch uh, changed the sound around him. As far as, as far as I'm concerned, Miles never changed his sound. He just changed the elements around him mm -hmm. as far as I can hear musically, being a musician. And so, but there were a lot of a hubbub about him selling out and things of that nature. Well, that's not necessarily because uh, there's nothing wrong 
with making money. We're here in America. <laughs> well, I wish I'd have known that uh, 50 years ago. You see, had I known that 50 years ago, I would uh, probably be very well off because I would have an agent, a manager, and, and try to go through that particular aspect. And, and, and like so many of us, we were not afforded the opportunity to do that, and we decided to try to do something for ourselves. Set on uh, the presidents of, um, we can go back to the uh, 1908 and the, uh, the uh, uh, Black, uh, 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 Black Music Association in Harlem, where they were, it was like a union, and, and things of that nature, and then progress up to uh, other, where, other times in history where uh, the musicians themselves came together and uh, uh, for, uh, to try to uh, have self-determination, try to control their own music, try to uh, also have, uh, uh, also have uh, a degree of control over what, when, and where they play. And so, uh, so during this particular period uh, that, I, that I'm uh, speaking on, uh, the 19, uh, basically, for me, 1962 to 1985, and I have uh, uh, documentary history. Okay, as we go back, can you back up one? Because I was not looking at this. Uh, yeah, now, uh, this is, uh, uh, a lot of you may not be familiar, but this is uh, Leon Thomas at uh, Studio Rivvy. Uh Studio Rivvy was a place uh, that uh, I know that, uh, that many of us had, and uh, Studio Rivvy is probably, uh, for the Lower East Side, one of the uh, uh, better known uh, spots because, because it was ran by <laughs> Sam Rivers, a uh, very accomplished musician. He's played across the board from, uh, from rhythm and blues to uh, Miles Davis to in anyone else, and, uh, and according to him, himself, because he was a great man and a great, uh, so in, in my book. So, uh, and, uh, and this is with uh, another gentleman. He played with, uh, with uh, the Aboriginal Music Society. And uh, I'd like to just, for, for a moment, just give you a 15-second sample of some of the songs because every, every, every band, just like every individual, had a different sound they were developing. Some of them uh, developed off of standard tunes. Some of them developed off of uh, other uh, tribal sounds, others develop off of uh, what, whatever they can come up with. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, what, uh, this is Milford Graves. Oh, can we go back to that? Okay, okay, since we have it. Uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with Milford Graves, but uh, even to this day, uh, he's, he's another uh, icon uh, in the area of free jazz and uh, uh, he was, he's an icon in the area of free jazz. He's also uh, uh, into herbal and Chinese medicine. Uh, he's, uh, he's really uh, considered a, a sensei and a, a very, uh, maintain a very wholesome spiritual life. And uh, a lot of us were concerned in that area uh, about um, uh, the whole being, you know, e even at that time. And um, so, uh, uh, now, I just wanted to, I wanted to play a clip uh, of uh, just uh, some of the sounds, uh, maybe a 10 second clip. Now this particular track are, are sounds of, um, keep it up, the, the sounds uh, and music that, that uh, from uh, the Aboriginal Music Society and uh, they did play uh, standard music but also they were into uh, areas of uh, experimenting with, with uh, different sounds from around the world. This particular track uh, was done at uh, Rashi Ali. 
It wasn't quite a loft, as they call it, but he had turned it into a business and had a, a lot of problems because of, of how he handled it. But he was about uh, self-determination. He's got his jaw broke at once, his leg broke another time. And that's because he was at, uh, just right down there, right at Little Italy. And so, and he was, uh, but he started it and uh, uh, it, was, it was a wonderful place and an outlet for the music. But he had a, a more uh, commercial mind uh, about it. And also he had, uh, a lot of business acumen, which which it was lacking in uh, in the uh, foundation of like the New York Musicians Organization, because uh, uh, it was not able to sustain itself, because most of the people were just interested in playing music. Okay, okay. So, so I, I would like to uh, uh, maybe just. Uh, uh, Turn my attention to the uh, uh, the New York uh, Musicians uh, Organization Studio We, and the reason why I, I mention that is that so many people. We had the uh, University of the Streets, which operated a number of programs. We had uh, uh, the Harlem Culture Council, uh, we, uh, where uh, they allowed us to uh, people to rehearse. We had uh, just so many entities that that offered. Uh, themselves as uh, outlets, after, after solicitation of course, uh, to uh, allow musicians to have places to perform, uh, perform their work. So uh, there was, a, there was a, uh, an emphasis on, on fusion um, um, music at that time uh, in, in my world, uh, there were, but there were also people that, uh, that just uh, played uh, improvisational, there were, there were big bands. And, and the thing about when we came together is that uh, there, there wasn't a, a lot of uh, personal uh, predilections like, okay, well, uh, I don't like your band because uh, I, I, I don't like, I don't want to play the uh, old school or the standards. I think that uh, the musicians, old and young, had a high degree of respect. Because as I reflect to uh, some of the uh, first meetings that, uh, uh, that had happened uh, between uh, the New York Musicians Organization. And I, I would just like to uh, say that the reason why the New York Musicians Organization came together is because uh, in 1973, Newport moved, uh, moved from uh, Newport, Rhode Island to uh, New York City. And, uh, um, uh, I, was, I was at that time working and, and uh, st living at Studio We, and, and, and many of the musicians that came through on a daily basis noticed that the majority of the roster uh, playing at the uh, uh, Newport Festival, they were imported. Uh, very few out of, out of over 1,500 musicians that we knew and were active with, very few of them played with any of the mainstream band, even as sidemen, let alone any leaders. And uh, uh, we felt that it, it should have been addressed. And so looking at the history of the Newport, we saw that Max Roach and uh, Charlie Mingus and those guys uh, back in uh, 1965 boycotted. They ran an alternative festival across the street from the Newport Festival. And, uh, and uh, they, uh, they are not across the street, but not far down the road. And it was one of the early uh, protest festivals to Newport. And so based on that, we said, well, why can't we do something uh, in that respect? And that was after meeting with them and saying, well, uh, you know, at that time I was at the meeting and, uh, and I was more interested in, in some of the artists that were uh, uh, projecting a, a newer type or, of, of sound. Although we had, uh, I mean, on that roster, they didn't have uh, Archie Shep, they didn't have Sam Rivers. They didn't have some of the notables that were that were uh, around. Uh, they didn't have Arnett or some of the people that we thought were exploring uh, the new areas of music. Uh, and so, and, and mainly they had more blues and, and things of that, that nature commercially, but not understanding the commercial ramifications. Uh, we had a meeting with them, and they denied denied us. And so uh, many. Uh, so we decided that. Uh, we would get together and, and figure out what we can do. We knew that uh, Rassan, Roland Kirk, uh, previously had uh, 
and with uh, R.T. Shep and a number of people had boycotted the uh, Whitney Museum uh, to get jobs. We knew that Rassan and, and people had, had boycotted, boycotted, not boycotted, but uh, played in front of radio, uh, TV stations to get black musicians to play uh, in, on TV years before and things of that nature. So we had a little bit to build on. Uh, not, not total knowledge, but we had a little bit to build on. And through the many people that were there, old and young, and uh, uh, I was not the youngest there, or the, or the oldest, but there were many of them. And so, uh, <coughs> excuse me. But uh, they came together, and, 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 and basically, basically, they, they just wanted uh, work. And uh, we were, we, were uh, we had a, uh, uh, at studio, we had had a nonprofit called the Society of Universal Cultural Arts. Uh, it was established in Pittsburgh, maybe uh, in, around 19 uh, in the uh, early 60s by uh, James Du Bois, and he had brought that uh, uh, that nonprofit entity to New York. And uh, a gentleman named um, Burton Green moved upstate New York uh, to a. Uh, 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 a collective um, a musical colony, and he gave uh, the loft to James Du Bois, and uh, and he subsequently began to take over over the uh, uh, the different six floors of, of the building, and uh, there was music and artists in, in there all the time, so uh, that was that was uh, one place where uh, that was organized, and uh, there were. Uh, fundraising activities through uh, like the State Council and the Arts and the National Endowment to uh, uh, do things as a presenting organization and it, uh, to establish it. And uh, the same thing was happening over at the University Streets because they were, uh, they were running daycare programs, school programs, they were running just a number, they had another six-story building. And so during that period, uh, the musicians decided to try to meet on, on uh, Mutual turf. Uh, out of all the, uh, I think there had to be close to a hundred musicians that were uh, spinning around and, and talking about uh, the issue of Newport, and and so uh, you know there were many musicians from the free jazz movement, but they were uh, they were sub they were really supportive of, of all the forms of uh, of the music that was originated in the black community, and. Uh, yeah, a number of them were from the past. I mean, we, we presented uh, uh, like uh, Sam Wooding and uh, uh, I, I don't recall her name, but uh, Sam Wooding and the Chocolate Kitties that recorded in 1926. And, and so we weren't showing, uh, you know, our own personal choices, but we were, we, we respected the elders, although we didn't want to, uh, you know, play maybe in, in their particular band. Uh, and. Uh, the meetings, they were also all, 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 always interesting, <laughs> to say the least, because uh, uh, the, the opinions were as, as varied as, as uh, the musical styles that were represented there. Uh, they were just a, a wide variety. And there were plenty of uh, disagreements, but in the end, uh, they, they all recognized the uh, common ground uh, in which was uh, to secure economic, Created control of, of uh, our art farm, secure, secure work recognition after, uh, uh, you know, just to be secure work and recognition uh, period. And so during this period, the meeting organization, it was decided that uh, James Du Bois and myself uh, volunteered or we, we, to, uh, to help administrate uh, the uh, protest festival. And uh, so um, we, we went on to, uh, we felt that since we had a, uh, maybe a, uh, a, a door into some of the funding organization that we can help secure the funds uh, to do it. And so uh, we began to look at uh, the, uh, the older artist run uh, initiatives uh, in the African American community. And uh, you can see that a few years before um, they had uh, Chicago, the, Art and, uh, the uh, AACM, they had uh, in St. Louis, they had BAG, and, and many musicians migrated from these different organizations to New York, and, and they brought some of the knowledge with them. And uh, uh, I found that, that, that our shortcoming was that uh, at that time, 
uh, we, we were drawing and, and through our, our, our inexperience that uh, we didn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, but we threw out a lot of uh, uh, entities that could have been more helpful uh, to sustain, uh, you know, those various uh, individual spots and also the organization itself because uh, most of us were musicians and all we wanted to do was play music. And so uh, uh, many of us stepped over, Sam Rivers, James Du Bois, they all, myself, we step over and we uh, uh, apply time to administrative. And that's not the most, uh, uh, unless you have uh, business training, uh, it's not the most pleasant field to be in because it's uh, basically trial and error. Uh, in many respect, and that's where I go back to, uh, uh, you know, had I been educated in uh, business administration or something of that nature, uh, it, it would have been a, a, another story. And I don't think that uh, anyone that was involved in the uh, uh, the nuts, nuts and bolts operation of the organization had that type of experience, except for uh, I think uh, we had uh, uh, Professor Bunchy Fox who came and volunteered. Uh, we had a, a, a Lynn Sharp. We had a few people from from the colleges. But being uh, young and dumb in a lot of respect, we, uh, a lot of uh, the advice that they had, and uh, we could not afford uh, public relation, a lot of the things uh, that, that they had, but we, they were able to be uh, you know, very helpful in, uh, in the short term, in the short term. So, uh, so uh, many of the older musicians were aware of artist-run initiatives in, Amer in uh, African American community debating back to, back to the 20th century, uh, like the New York uh, Clef Club, founded in uh, 1910. The club operated as both a labor union, a booking agency for black performers, and the jazz, uh, oh, yeah, we come up years later, the, the jazz artist guild called Jazz, JAG, J A G, of uh, the 60s began to uh, uh, strive toward uh, broader collective ideas addressing uh, the economic inequities. Uh, uh, that permeated the uh, the jazz industry, and all all along that it, it seems that out of uh, people here, uh, I mean there there were great artists. Like you look at someone who was a uh, uh, pivotal, John Coltrane. Well, I mean you you go to each community. It's almost like traveling around. If people heard of Carnival, and people come out, they have hundreds of, of groups, and each town <laughs> has they have their masters. They have their people. And so, so uh, uh, Train happened to be, to me, master of masters. So one of them. Uh, the same, which we'll speak on shortly, of uh, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, yeah, so, but, uh, so, uh, but the, the industry and, and, and the control, and, and also it's about, uh, about the dollar. I mean, that's why we have the president that we have today. Uh, so, uh, so most of, most of us, we sort of distance ourselves from the standard power broker of the music industry, booking agencies, imp impresarios, and other middlemen. And uh, uh, you know, we s consciously did this, but uh, we did it to our own uh, economic detriment <laughs> at, you know, at that point, because many of us had an opportunity to go in that area, uh, to go into other areas uh, w which are considered commercial. Now, I don't, I don't find at this age uh, being commercially viable uh, repugnant. Uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, as long as you're true to your heart, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it, but at that time, uh, the, the, the thing uh, that was people look at is say, well, if you become a, a, a commercial success, you're a sellout. Well, it took me a long time to realize that it may not be true in all instances. In, in many instances, I have to agree that once they uh, uh, start telling you what to play, how to play it with all the producers and all their investments, uh, that uh, you may have to compromise uh, to where you're not being a, a true artist to yourself. And so and you can, you can, you can churn out the same music for 20, 30 years, four years, play the same tune over every night. But uh, uh, for me, it's boring. And, it's, uh, uh, and, and it's, it's not beyond boring. It's, uh, uh, it doesn't show any, any uh, 
creative growth and development. So, so in, uh, in 1964, the Jazz Composer Guild began uh, producing their own independent events, hoping to build a, a grassroot uh, demand uh, for their work. And they were mainly uh, composers uh, uh, throughout New York. It was really in the New York area. Uh, in uh, 1965, saw the rise of the Chicago uh, Association for the Advancement of a Creative Musician, AACM. Uh, they succeeded in building a sturdy coalition of African-American artists to pursue a series of goals, concert, production, promotional initiative, educational programs. And uh, it's, it remains uh, the best known collective uh, in, in the United States and is still active today. Uh, in 1968 in the Midwest, uh, the St. Louis Black Artist Group, BAG, was founded. Uh, and it was focused on uh, community activism. Uh, and it was, uh, it was, it was uh, basically built around, uh, I guess, the uh, great society. But there was a lot of money flowing into the community, so they were able to, to, uh, to get off in, in that respect. So, uh, so uh, when the New York Musicians uh, uh, Organization came together, I just said it was the, uh, a, a consortium of uh, of people, it wasn't just uh, uh, musicians. It was artists that were interested in the music and said, "Hey, I, I, I want to help, uh, or you can use my space, or we can we can do this." And so uh, places started happening, not just in the Lost, but all, uh, throughout uh, all the boroughs of New York. And uh, we tried to take some uh, 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 tips from the other organizations in the past, uh, but we were. Overwhelmed, I'm just staffed, underfunded, and uh, we just did what, what, what we can do. Uh, we uh, we were able to be successful because, in uh, as I mentioned before, 1972, Newport came to New York. We organized a festival. We ran uh, five days of music, 24 hours a day. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing, but 24 hours a day in protest. And uh, uh, that did accomplish something because what it did, it, we got the attention. We got the attention of Newport and, uh, and also we got the attention of uh, other, other entities in, in New York uh, that, were, that were funding uh, from the uh, mayor's office to uh, borough presidents to the uh, uh, city run programs that had slight funding and they were in, uh, in support of what we did because we did it everywhere. We did it. Uh, on the rooftops, we did it in the parks. <laughs> we, uh, we did it in concert halls, where, wherever, we, wherever we could uh, produce the music. <laughs> Subways, way before it was popular. <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, what happened with that is that in 1973, okay, oh, okay. Uh, we can go back, way back. Okay, <laughs> okay, even one more, go ahead. All right, in, in 1973, uh, these are concerts that were happening. Uh, uh, Studio Wii, uh, we have, uh, these are flyers. These are illustrations of flyers from Studio Wii. And, and these were just some of the events we were, we were featuring, featuring at Studio Wii because we found that, that uh, we were able to do, do something on a weekly basis. And the number of unemployed musicians and, and, and uh, uh, the wages, the immigrant wages that we had to pay, uh, which was basically the door, and uh, we, we opened up many venues, but uh, it was better to, uh, to do that than, than not to be heard because uh, many musicians were practicing extensively and, uh, and they would never had an opportunity to be heard. So, uh, so I'd like to say that jazz has always been changing and an enduring art whose roots are uh, firmly planted here in the United States. And it's sad when we consider uh, this music to be our, our really only contribution to the world arts that the American people are not more aware and appreciative 
uh, appreciative of this uh, unique art form. And, uh, you know, it's been called by many names, Ragtime, Dixieland, Swing, Bebop, Modern, Contemporary. I mean, we're, we, we just keep hopping along to now we have hip hop, which is the, the most, uh, uh, it's the largest s selling uh, s so called artistic endeavor around the world. I am, I'm going to let that everyone decide for themselves in, in, in that respect. Uh, but it is, uh, it is a, a sign of the time and it is what the, what the young people are, are, are doing and what they're saying and what, and, uh, uh, and I think they, like any other artist, if, uh, should deserve to be uh, listened to. So uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, we'll, we'll advance here. Okay, these are concerts that, uh, that we were doing. Uh, oh, I had mentioned the uh, Jazz Heritage Series. I think this Jazz Heritage Series, we rented uh, Brooklyn Academy, well no, this one was at Pace University. And we ran at Pace University, and, and we, uh, a lot of people hadn't heard Shirley Scott in years. Uh, Renee McLean and, uh, was uh, Jackie McLean's son. And uh, uh, we have over here uh, the uh, Average Music Society. So and, uh, this is a cross-section between uh, uh, what we were able to do with uh, uh, the New York Musicians Organization and uh, basically Studio We. We'll take the next one. Now, now this takes us back uh, years. We have uh, uh, the gentleman on trumpet is uh, Earl Cross, and uh, uh, that's uh, that's myself and and a gentleman named uh, Michael Berardi. And uh, this photo was probably taken in, in uh, the uh, summer of 1968. And uh, this proceed this particular uh, photo precedes the. Uh, 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 the New York Musicians Organization. This was a, uh, a, a, a an artist uh, collective ran by uh, Bob and Isabel Lacala up in uh, Socrates, New York, called Group Two One Two. And what they did, he was a, an art professor at uh, uh, Newport College, and he ran a summer program for uh, for all of the arts. I mean, I, uh, when we were there, we had uh, uh, great. Uh, great people on staff and great people there. I had an opportunity to uh, uh, collaborate with uh, Charles Gardone, who wrote No Place to Be Somebody. Uh, he was a great uh, uh, author, uh, and, and it, was, it was highly, I mean, it was not even encouraged. It was necessary to collaborate with uh, the artists of other disciplines. And so uh, in, in terms of, uh, of what uh, in terms of what our activities were. So they had, uh, you know, the musicians were, were on site for the theater. Uh, I, I, I gravitated up there because I, I played for the, uh, the dance class every morning and every day. And it started out there. And, uh, and, and when we started, uh, we finally started producing concerts there. In fact, we probably produced a concert there uh, a year before Woodstock. I don't have the photo with me, but I, I happened to go through the press, and it was in uh, 1968 that we built platforms and we were doing concerts. And at the same time, there were other things. There was a, a sound out, and, and they never had uh, jazz. It was uh, like more of a bluegrass festival. And uh, uh, Sonny Simmons came up and joined us, and we were broke, broke into that, uh, playing, uh, what, I guess what he called at that time, Reebok, you know. Uh, and, uh, and they started bringing on, um, you know, more acts, but it was more of a, a folk program, and we were produced in town. So, and, and that's where I survived uh, for many years from probably making drums and instruments. That's just one of the drum shacks. We'll take the next one, please. Well, that's Mike Berardi. Well, uh, the gentleman in the corner is, uh, was uh, Barry Alshoot. Uh, uh, you may or may not know of him, but he was, uh, Formative in the uh, in the music area. Okay. Okay. Uh, this gentleman here is a uh, uh, Burton Green. He is he was instrumental to me because he's the one that when he decided to move out of town, he gave a uh, a loft space. He gave one of the spaces to James Du Bois. Said, "Come and take it. I have to go." And that resulted into uh, Studio We. 
and uh, this is myself and, and James Du Bois outside of Studio Wee. And uh, with, uh, with him is uh, a band they had, uh, this uh, Bayard Lancaster, Shelley Rustin, and I'm not sure who's in the corner, but uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is James Du Bois. I've mentioned his name a number of times, and uh, this was uh, Studio Wee Japanese Day. And uh, we, we had uh, many, many events, and that's what this was. Uh, uh, Nakamura, I think, think it's the gentleman's name was, but he turned out to be a formative saxophone player that came here and studied uh, and uh, actually recorded at Studio We. And okay, this is pretty uh, self explanatory, is how we felt, uh, many of us. Uh, he's saying, How am I doing, Norm? And he says, Well, the public's not ready for you yet, so shut up and keep playing. <laughs> okay, all right, next. Okay, we have, uh, we have uh, this is uh, Noah Howard. Uh, he was, he was uh, part of the, uh, on the board of the New York Musician Organization. He was a uh, very activist. Now, I have to mention that, that a number of people were active. They were either active in their music or, or, or self, promotion, they were active in civil rights, they were active in, in, in so many different areas. And so uh, uh, to, to assume that because it was a so-called loft movement that everybody was of like mind, that is not true. Everyone had, just like we're all in this room and in different individuals and we, and we can sit here and have different opinions. And, and part, of, uh, part of it, philosophy, if we took James Ball and then he says, we can disagree and still love each other until your disagreement is rooted in my oppression and denial of my humanity and right to equally exist. Should I read that again? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. We can disagree and still love each other unless your disagreement is rooted in the oppression and denial of my humanity and right to equally exist. And uh, so uh, that means that we could sit in the table and we can have far disagreement, but uh, as, as long as you don't, our disagreement don't tread on me, we can walk away as we came in peace. That's what it means to me. So as youngsters, uh, I could tell you myself, uh, in, in terms of the civil rights movement. Okay. Okay. Uh, hold that, please. In terms of the civil rights movement, uh, in terms of uh, being an artist, when I was coming up through the 60s, uh, it was about defy the rules and damn the consequences. You know, basically, I was living on the, on the edge pretty recklessly. And uh, uh, because uh, I saw so much dramatic upheaval around. I uh, wanted to uh, uh, pretty much ex expand, uh, you know, expand the op open the envelope, open the envelope for uh, further exploration. Uh, I, I, I have uh, this is a uh, Hannibal Marvin Peterson. Uh, he was one of the, uh, I mean, we, uh, I, I'm here, I'm not here to, uh, to bring forth the, all the, the great individuals that you know, but uh, there are so many people that were uh, unsung heroes who were, had, had abilities and had properties that, that it took probably another 20, 30 years for uh, people to catch up with them, you know, and uh, they say, okay, select, uh, like, uh, to be honest with you, they knew each other. Um, Freddie Hubbard mm -hmm. and Hannibal, they knew each other. My choice, my, my own personal choice, yeah. I, I, I would have chose Hannibal yeah. because of his ability. But he never, uh, no, I won't say he never, I just heard him. He's writing symphonies, he's doing great. But during that period, he was shut out from the mainstream. And he was just as great as far as, 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 far as I was concerned, my own opinion. And uh, so we'll go to the next one, please. Okay, we have, uh, we have many people uh, of renown. Uh, uh, 
This young man here played with just about everybody. His name is <laughs> Hakeem Jameen. He's in Detroit, uh, but he, he played just uh, so much around. And uh, you talk about a heart and dedication. To this day, I, I'm still in communication with him. And uh, uh, to this day, and so uh, there's no way uh, I have uh, hundreds of photos, hundreds of recordings, and uh, we would be here for a year if I tried to present it all and, I could, and, and mention all the, the ones involved. Because what I would like to do is just focus on, on attention o over uh, to, to let you know that uh, very few of these people you will ever see in the media, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, they haven't committed the type of crimes that it's necessary to get there these days. <laughs> but uh, you know, I just want to give you a reference here. You know, the media from Malcolm X. The media, the most powerful entity on earth. They have the power to make the innocent guilty, and to make the guilty innocent. And and that's power because they control the minds of the masses. And so uh, the, I have the same uh, opinion of, of the industry, of the, of the recording industry. And um, I have pretty much that, uh, that, as we can see right now, that they still control the minds of the masses. And uh, right now, the, the, uh, the popular trend is uh, uh, the spoken word various uh, things of that nature. Well, well I, I, I personally know that, to me, if I wrote a song and I say, oh, thank God for this land where together we stand, a place where we all can be free to reach for the sky with others who try, with others as bold as we. Now, with that, I'm asking you to go somewhere and in 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 just pure musical form and playing uh, improvisationally and playing uh, just songs without words, you 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 leave people room to uh, uh, to go where they want to go, need to go, and things, and that's that's how I feel. That's how I compare personally compare uh, the music. So. Uh, I know from, from uh, that the industry has been taking uh, the popular thought and, 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 and the mind in a direction that has not been beneficial to humankind in, in, in many areas, uh, on the commercial area. And so uh, we knew this back then, and that's why uh, some of the music we play uh, at that time uh, was static. It was, it was uh, a lot of it, we, we did it intentionally. Uh, we did it uh, inside compositions, and we did it from the beginning. Uh, you know, many artists just start out, and uh, not that you couldn't play a, a beautiful melody, but, uh, uh, but through your expression, like they talk about the blues, we can get back to talking about jazz and, and what, uh, what the uh, true American classical music is, uh, and, and we would know that it, it encompasses it, all of it. It encompasses it, it all, and it, and it, and it comes from uh, African American heritage. So, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, this is a band. Uh, I just put this up here because uh, uh, there were other bands, uh, the Art Ensemble of Chicago. They, they had it. This was a, a band called Juju, and uh, I think their, uh, their first album was uh, called Message for Mozambique, and, uh, and they reflected the rhythms with the, uh, a mixture of uh, so-called American jazz. It was American music, and uh, it was here, very highly rhythmical, and a, a very talented group of people. But they decided, well, we're just going to uh, take on our garments, we're going to paint our face, and uh, they know what it all means. I don't, tribally, <laughs> you know, the markings. But they had an intention in mind, and so. Funky. Yeah, see? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, true. We were just talking about it. Go ahead. Okay, we'll move on. Because the next one, 
Uh, this is, uh, these are uh, uh, just photos that we produced in, uh, uh, I mean, they came from Alice Tully Hall. This is, this is uh, basically the same band presented when, Ali, when uh, 1973, Newport decided that they were coming back to New York and they offered us Alice Tully Hall, Carnegie Hall. And that was only based on uh, the, because we had, we had stolen all of their press the previous year. <laughs> and so they gave us those to produce in. And so we had a chance to uh, uh, produce concerts in, in major concerts hall. And so we had just uh, from uh, Unknown at the time, Plunky and uh, Juju. We had Babatunde Lee. Uh, he was more known. He's played with great. This is uh, Reggie uh, Workman. Reggie Workman, and he was in one of the bands. He was not leading a band at that time. He was in one of the bands. So, uh, all right. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, the time is running out. So I'm, uh, I'm going to do, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to, um, it's 8 o'clock, and uh, I would like to uh, just to in invite uh, Daoud Arum, to, to, to speak a few words with you over the period, because he was there. And each one of us saw it through our eyes and had a different reflection. I believe he came from Boston area and came into the area, and we share a lot of experiences uh, with, in fact, we recorded an album together with Earl Cross. So would you please come up, sir, for a few minutes, because we have We have a couple minutes, and then I'd just like to get a couple questions and answers. Time is fast. Go ahead, sir. Yeah. <clears throat> is it on? Push is it on. this on? It. No. Yeah, it's on. Well, it's coming to me. Oh, it's coming to the camera, so speak here. It's coming? Yeah, speak here. Speak here so the people can hear. Okay. <clears throat> in all honesty, we have yet another gentleman here sitting in the front. Yes, sir. Who helped build Studio Week. <laughs> That's right. Who helped clean it up. <laughs> who helped do the plumbing that they said that there was no plumbing at a lot of... He became very, he became, not only was he a student of the bass, we know him here in Houston, I mean in Durham, as Abdul Hamid, but this brother, I'm many of us would not have had heat in our <laughs> lofts in our apartments or storefronts had it not been for this brother. We used to lug bathtubs up four flights <laughs> of stairs, and as I said, many of these bathtubs were in the main, in the living room with everything else, the bed and so forth and so on. But I couldn't say not a word about this particular era. This man was probably as essential to that era as any of us, Definitely. as Juma or myself. But he's really one of the unsung heroes. And I know he doesn't want me saying a word about him here, but I'm talking about him and you should avail yourself of him. And he was, I'm not going to mention all the circumstances for him, but he was a bartender at Slugs, <laughs> the famed Slugs, in its, during its heyday when many of the historical events that you're reading about now happened. Okay? Those of you who are aware of cinema, jazz cinema, you, 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 uh, if you don't know, they recently made a movie, was released, on the life of Lee Morgan. Everybody in here know who Lee Morgan is? Yes, okay. I do. <laughs> <clears throat> right. Yeah. And I think, I think the name of the movie is, I called him Morgan. I called him Morgan. People are talking about it all over the world. But if you want to know some more about Morgan and the unfortunate circumstances under which he left the planet, this is a man sitting right in the front. He's an eyewitness right here, and to many of the events in New York in what was called the loft period. Let me just say this. <clears throat> the loft era or period in avant-garde music in New York City was composed of many, many, many different types of locations, as Juma mentioned. As he mentioned, Rashid Ali's Ali's Alley. Right. On Green right. Share some of your spaces. Go yeah. ahead, man. Excuse me? No, I said share your spaces. Go ahead. Share what you, real quick, what you just, you know, the different areas. Okay. That you know. It was Rashid Ali's <clears throat> Ali's Alley. 
Ali having been, maybe some of you don't know who Rashid Ali is, but he replaced, he was with the John Coltrane group at its heyday, at its pinnacle, at the same time as Elvin Jones. John Coltrane used two drummers. And sometimes he used three drummers. At other times he used four and five drummers. In many of the loft settings, the whole place would be filled with drummers. John Coltrane would wear out drummers, dozens of them. I've witnessed these drummers throw their sticks down on the floor in frustration, and they had not an ounce of strength left in them, and this man went on and on and on and on. I witnessed this at Birdland. But this is the dynamic level of a John Coltrane who could walk into an environment, and there could be 50 or 100 musicians there, and he would play with all of them. He would play with all of them. And as he moved around and moved throughout, this is a genius, by the way. He could move about and move through, and he would stop at different places, like a preacher. He was a preacher. John Coltrane was very much a preacher. And he was very much a teacher. And he, like many of the great educators of our time, particularly I'm thinking now of Rabindranath Tagore, the Indian master musician, literary genius of previous generations, was able to walk in an environment and create, create art. Another important aspect of this period, which is dead now, artists from all genres participated. They knew that their art was empty without each other. Painters just didn't come to support musicians because they felt sorry for the musicians didn't have a place to play. Artists on the level of Romare Bearden invited musicians to their home. This is documented. Yes, this is with the Marcellus brothers. Both Winton and his brother were little kids when his father would come up yearly from New Orleans with the family, Mrs. Marsalis and the boys, to sit and play on the floor of Romari Bearden Studios, while Romari Bearden would paint and do collages as the father would be sitting at the piano playing and composing, and they'd work certain things up. Max Roach, Art Blakey, also would come to Romari Bearden's lofts. I say lofts because he was located in different parts of the city. He also had a loft on Green Street at a certain point in time. So there was no separation in many instances. You had these old timers who encouraged the musicians and the painters and the poets and the writers and the actors. Unfortunately, in the beginning, when, when these snapshots came on, there was one live and you could see a lady dancing. This happened in many circumstances. Those of you who know the hero, the Durham hero, Chuck Davis, Yes. Chuck Davis was here at the same time. He came as a young boy. I remember Chuck. We had lofts together, true lofts together in Chinatown, side by side on East Broadway. Chuck Davis lived in these places. If Chuck was in here now, he would tell you, <clears throat> and I'll tell you for him, because he's my neighbor, <clears throat> that the greatest night that he ever experienced was in Slugs, where this man was the bartender, and, there were, and it was a rainy night like tonight. And there may be four or five of New York's best bass players were there, just standing with their basses out of the rain. And I think Billy Higgins might have been there. <clears throat> Those of you who know the music, Billy Higgins was a very fine drummer. And between Billy Higgins and five or six bass players and Chuck Davis, they tore slugs down. Now, this is the interaction. Today, musicians have become snobs. Academe has ruined many of our young people into thinking that this is a specialized situation and that you must have an academic degree. I can speak of this because I grew up. I was born virtually in a nightclub in Boston. I was raised in nightclubs. My family were raised, raised me in nightclubs. My mother used to work in an after-hours club. And as a baby, I, that's where I grew up, in these after-hours clubs. So my ears have been opened, and I can say honestly 
that I'm getting the sign <laughs> and I have to leave. But uh, I've been encouraged to think about redoing my Duke Ellington program. Wonderful. So stay here for a second. Yes. I, I only uh, asked the brother to come up here because, see, we all have different stories, different side. Uh, he's very clear, very succinct, and he has a whole another experience. Now, uh, for those who are running out of time, and I'm only saying that, that uh, those of you that wanted me to speak on, on Jimi Hendrix, I would do it briefly, and I'll open up for questions and answers because we do have to leave soon. And so I, I think with due respect, I'll, I'll introduce the, uh, uh, some of the elements of uh, Jimi Hendrix and share with you. Sure. Thank you. Not talk too much. <laughs> no, no, you're good. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Donald. Okay, thank you. Right. Well, you can see we're not snobs. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, it, 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 it's, it's very uh, difficult to just start with all the small innuendos of Jimi Hendrix. Uh, I never really uh, sought out to, uh, to play rock and roll or anything of that nature. In fact, as I said earlier, that I, I found uh, um, my own personal predilection uh, stopped me from doing that from my early years. And uh, even when I was in New York, I had a chance to meet, uh, uh, not New York, but uh, Berkeley, California in 1965. I met Richie Havens uh, at the uh, Sproul Plaza, you know, during those periods. And he said, oh, well, if you ever get to New York, play, come, come on over there, come with me. And uh, nobody ever knew he was a closet uh, a conga player like he is. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, that he played very, very good percussion and, 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 and conga. Um, and uh, so when I got to New York, I actually ended up across the street, right? Third Street was a hub, uh, you know, from him. But uh, to get to Hendrix, uh, Hendrix I met, in, uh, met him in Harlem, uh, ran into him again in the village. Um, I was living in upstate New York in uh, 1969 when he returned from uh, Europe. And I'm sitting there and he says, oh, well, why don't you come up to the house and jam? And uh, I, I did uh, go up there and we played together uh, at his house, uh, his manager's house for a few days. And uh, he was saying, well, I love it up here in the Catskill Mountains. I want to get a house. So he was thinking about uh, preparing for the, uh, the famed Woodstocks Festival. And uh, we um, uh, secured a house and we had uh, the band members there. But the thing is, is that he was uh, open and he was ready to change and uh, uh, basically all he wanted to do was uh, uh, come off the road. He was, he was the opposite of what we were doing. He was, his, his management kept him busy, real busy, and, and also kept him thinking that he was broke. No, letting him know that they, he was broke because they were stealing all of his money. But, uh, uh, so anyway. Um, in the process, uh, you know, we, we, we developed a strong relationship. We lived in the house for almost, uh, together for almost a year. But uh, you know, I had an opportunity to play with him and, and also to, uh, during the time that he wanted to uh, change uh, the format from uh, just the, uh, the trio to uh, open, up his, uh, open up, up his music to different sounds, uh, we auditioned so many musicians to see about coming into the band. But when it came down close to the festival, uh, the management said, okay, you have to hone it down. And he, and he has honed it down, his, his ideas down to Larry Lee, an, uh, another guitar player, which they never agreed that he needed. Uh, Billy Cox, an old uh, friend from the Army and, and also the Chitlin Circuit that he played bass with. And uh, uh, Gerardo Velez, an African, I mean, uh, a, a, a Latin percussionist and myself, plus uh, Mitch Mitchell. Um, who was, uh, uh, he really didn't want to get Mitch, but he couldn't find anyone uh, to carry uh, the sound that he was uh, trying to generate. So he brought Mitch back. And that was a band that performed at the uh, uh, Woodstock Festival, uh, uh, Salvation, uh, and, and a, a concert in Harlem. There's so much, and uh, I could keep talking and talking unless we want a question and answer period. Maybe I'll just keep, uh, keep going, but because uh, there's no way we can fit <laughs> Can, can, excuse me, but compress the information to, uh, to that degree. So, uh, because there's, there's, a, there's a lot of things that, that people don't know. Like uh, when we were in Harlem, they had uh, James Brown, uh, Big Mabel, da -da -da, and people almost threw rocks at us because uh, where he wanted to, to really have his music 
uh, displayed uh, because he was a, a product of the establishment, which I observed, that he was mainly uh, uh, exposed to the hippie population. And the black community during that period had absolutely no idea who Jimmy was. You know, they, they didn't. And he, and he had a concept of building a, a multiplex unit there for, uh, for sound and recording and video and, and different areas. He had his, his grand area, like, you know, coming back once he, once, once he got uh, rid of his manager, which was, would have been about six, eight months later, that he was going to do a, another thing. He had uh, grandiose plans, and it was called Heaven's Research Unlimited. And, and through Heaven Research Unlimited, what he talked about was uh, he had, uh, uh, at that time, they were Arthur and Albert, they're Tahaka and Tundi Ra now, but, uh, and, and other people that, uh, and myself, I had uh, unlimited times uh, signed up in Electric Lady Studio, where we would produce our music, and uh, he would record on it, and since he really realized that he had to do it, he would do it like, just like uh, Charlie Parker did, under an assumed name, and, uh, and just play the music and uh, uh, to, to generate uh, and, and um, promote talent. And so a lot of people weren't aware of that, and they weren't aware of that, that, that he, he knew that his management was robbing him blind because he shared things with me like uh, uh, he didn't own anything. Everything was in, uh, everything, everything was in uh, Michael Jeffries, his manager's name, even to all of his money going to the Cayman Island. And they don't even know that he didn't. He never even had a, a regular bank account. Okay, so uh, this is a Woodstock Festival. Both of them are. This is behind stage. Uh, the next day, this is from the festival, uh, just prior to the Star Spangled Banner. And uh, but so there's there's a, a lot of information, and uh, uh, I will be sharing that uh, in in uh, in my upcoming book. I will be uh, very clear. So, just to revert back to the uh, revert back to the, uh, the the jazz loft era before we open up for a couple of minutes of question and answer, there's a book I'll call Imp Impro Improvising New York. It's written by Michael Heller. Michael Heller is the uh, head of the uh, ethnomusicology department at uh, uh, University of uh, Pennsylvania in uh, Pittsburgh, and it just so happened that uh, when he was studying for his master's. Uh, we came together and uh, uh, from, his, uh, from his master's thesis uh, to uh, his doctorates, uh, he studied uh, and, and, and helped me coordinate my uh, archival collection, organize it. And uh, this book is a product of it and uh, of, of the experience and, and the information is clear. But what he can never do is what this brother can do and what I can do in our own words is write our own history. This book is factual, it's good, it's available, it's, it's online, on e on, 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 uh, and it's also available in, in bookstores. But I just said, unless you're uh, ready for a scholarly read, uh, you may want to wait for my book. <laughs> okay. Or, <my laughs> okay. or, or Brother Dowd's book, <laughs> right, because we all have a story to tell. Okay, so uh, I, at, at this time, thank you very much. I'd like to open the floor for question and answers. Juma. Yes. I set it straight. I've read and I've heard uh, years ago that uh, the sound man at Woodstock cut the track. He only had Hendrix and the trio and he cut the rhythm section out. Is that true okay. or is that a no, lie? The, the question was, uh, uh, the gentleman asked that, uh, that yes, it, it is true and I'll tell you that, uh, uh, that the, the management wanted only Mitch Mitchell, Noel Redding, and Jimi Hendrix on that stage. Uh, uh, with all the, the other brothers in defiance on that stage was, was one of uh, Jimmy's stands, and, and, uh, when, when I say that. And yes, the sound man, Eddie Kramer, uh, he was in the uh, audio truck. He, uh, he, didn't, he didn't like, uh, basically the Englishmen did not like all the black dudes up there on the stage. And they said that at the house, the stage, and, and everything. And plus, they did not understand the music, and they did not understand that it would have the synchro mesh as the trio, that he was opening the envelope and expanding the sound. Now I want you to play uh, uh, one of the Jimi Hendrix songs, because people always ask me, if he ever comes out of the box, I'll play you, I'll play you a piece here where, when I came to New York, the jazz musicians respected him. I couldn't care if he only played in one key. 
he can play, he can play more than that, but you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but he was about sound. And so when I came to New York and, uh, did, and back to the jazz community, he had high respect because of, of his innovation. So would you, yeah, either Shokan Sunrise or one of those. Okay, well, we had, it. it's not on there. It's not on there. No, okay, well, you, we, we may not see. I have sound samplings that the world hasn't heard of Jimi Hendrix playing at the, at the go, if you go back here to Tinker Street, we'll take our time for a minute. And, and uh, if we have another question in a minute, go back to the Tinker Street Cinema with Jimi Hendrix and the, and the group. And Earl Cross is in that group too. So do we have another question while he's finding the uh, program? Not, yes, would, huh? I want to say that one of the, one of the laws that were missing that, that you didn't discuss was Jolie's Ladies Sport. Ladies Sport, well, I had Hakeem Jermaine here. As I said, okay, he had said that I didn't mention the ladies for it. I didn't mention a lot of places, yeah. see, uh, because uh, uh, in order to do that, it would have to be conscripted. I have a paper here. I could give you, you know, all of our locations. Uh, it's very difficult. I, I, I just turned, uh, I keep saying a quarter, three quarters century, a couple, you know what I mean, weeks ago. So I don't, <laughs> I can't remember everything. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that's for night. But yes, uh, I agree. I mean, and, and, and believe me that uh, they all deserve honorable mention. And, and, and uh, they're not precluded intentionally. You know what I mean? I'm not leaving them out intentionally. It's just I haven't got around to it yet. Uh, no, 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 that's uh, AMS. Okay, uh, I could tell you. Go to, which one, okay? I'm, I'm not sure. I just wanted to play you a simple a sample of uh, maybe uh, just a short clip of Jimmy playing out a whole other area where you'd have to really listen to record. Okay, this one here, turn it up. No, that's not it. Okay, I, I thought it might be the one we call stratospheric. That's not it, that's not the Hendrix stuff. Okay, we're gonna have, we're gonna have to leave that. Uh, Eventually, uh, you could go to my website and pick it up, uh, but right now I haven't even got that far in the uh, uh, establishing the website. So do we have uh, other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, and, and I'll get to you next. Uh, hey. what, one of the uh, tracks on the, wood, on the Woodstock um, soundtrack, it's, um, I think it's after Purple Haze, maybe. Um, it's a slow thing where he's, Jimmy's playing octaves, and, he, and it kind of basically sounds like He'd been listening to West Montgomery. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I believe that was Jam Back at the House, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong, but I believe that one is, yeah. And uh, uh, I just want to tell you that, that he, uh, he had that, uh, the ability to play that particular sound. Of, and you heard it, of, uh, the, and if you heard some of the things that I was going to try to play, you would see that, uh, uh, yes, I totally uh, agree, agree with you. And everyone know that he was saying he was playing more in a mode of uh, West Montgomery instead of what people were accustomed to him playing. And uh, so, and, and your question, please. My first question was that if you have a question, please come up here to the microphone so we can get it uh, on the recording. Oh. And also, if um, you had a, I'm sure you have a probably top 20 or top 30, do you have a favorite show or favorite memory um, of performing that well, you could share? Well, well since we're, since we're uh, uh, in terms of memory and, and we're talking here and we're talking about Jimi Hendrix, when you walk out and uh, like we have a, a limited audience here and you see as far as the eye can see, all you see are faces. Uh, that's a memorable experience. That's one of the top. I couldn't care if you were playing, dancing, or singing, or, or just walking across the stage. <laughs> it's a kind of a memorable, memorable experience. And, 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 and to, uh, to be able to share uh, to uh, a, a crowd that big and also uh, get feedback, it is still lasts to now. So I haven't uh, experienced anything much greater than that uh, day of walking out in Woodstock in terms of that. Okay. Uh, so I think we're going to have to stop pretty soon. Uh, with uh, we have more yeah. questions? Let's see. I think we can do about two more questions. Please come up to the mic if you have a question you'd like to ask. Okay. Well, so, since we have no more questions, I, I, and I put my cards away over here, I had some, just a few tidbits. And don't forget to tell everybody about the CD. Oh, oh, okay. 
You're right. Okay, uh, for those of you who don't know that uh, I think I waited 40 years to re release a CD. Uh, this is available on Amazon. It's a limited edition. It's, uh, 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 it's called uh, Father of Origin, uh, and it's the Aboriginal Music Society. A lot of people think that when you're calling the Aboriginal Music Society, no, I'm just talking about indigenous, uh, the Father of Origin around the world, the Ab Aboriginal, the indigenous people around the world. Uh, but, but the music is uh, very uh, eclectic, it, it is, uh, um, and it reflects, uh, it's from that period. Uh, and, and, and along with it comes a 26-page uh, a booklet uh, informing you of the different uh, musician and times and, and information, uh, plus a, a sample CD, uh, and it's a, a, a two-volume, and it's uh, available on Amazon. And the other one is uh, Whispers from the Archive, which is from uh, just a little later period. And, uh, um, and it's an Aboriginal Music Society. This one here is very different because it'll take you uh, from, from avant-garde to uh, rhythm and blues. Uh, you know, so it's a very eclectic album. And uh, these are some of the things that are available. And this is also available on CD, uh, the, this one. This one isn't yet, but uh, the Aboriginal Music Society will probably uh, at, toward the end of the year, be available on CD. So, uh, well, well, I want to thank everyone for coming, and uh, I certainly appreciate it, and I, I hope that you found it fulfilling. Have a good night.